come real and it's going to come raw. But look at somebody say, but it's going to be good for you. Truth be told, that's why you come to harvest, because you need it real and raw. You don't, y'all not saying nothing. And so thank you for that, and uh, we look forward to that. Also, listen, today's message is going to be available right after uh, today's worship experience in the bookstore and cafe. And also, I want to give you some dates now. It's been about five years since we've had a what we used to call camp meeting. And so this year, we're going to do to celebrate our ninth anniversary since we were planted from scratch in what they call the church planters graveyard so we're going to do a three-day harvest conference this year on wednesday may 20th through friday may 22nd now listen we've not done one in a while so many of you are like bishop what is that let me just tell you it is the most exciting and power-packed three days that you could ever imagine so write those dates down and remember those dates we'll have more information as we continue to move forward somebody say wednesday may 20th wednesday. through friday may 22nd so listen, you got to be here. I don't care what you got to do, cancel whatever else you got going on, because that's going to be the most powerful three days of your entire year. And so we're excited about that. Y'all ready to get into the word today? As you stand with me, lift your Bibles out. You don't have a Bible, lift a hand, lift your mobile device, whatever you have. And let's say it together. I am unconditionally loved by God and at harvest. I come to him just as I am but I won't stay as I am because the message I'm prepared to receive will make me more like the great I am. I am blessed and I am favored in Jesus' name. Remain standing for just a moment. We're in a series of teachings called Surge. I want you to flip to Ezekiel chapter 37. Somebody say Surge. That is not only the series that we're in, but it is the theme of our entire year. I said it's the theme of our entire year. And some of you, you may say, Bishop, well, why are they shouting about that? You'll find out in just a minute. Go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, last week, last uh, weekend, and then this past midweek, we were here, and uh, I want to look at it from a different angle. The, the beautiful thing about the Word of God is that the Bible says it's alive, which means, watch this, every time I look at it, it can speak something fresh, it can speak something new in a different context. Ezekiel chapter 37, look at verse number 4. Again, he said to me, prophesy or speak. Somebody say, speak. Speak to these bones. In other words, he says, speak to your problems. He said, I know your problems are speaking to you, but I need you to turn around and start speaking to them. I know your financial issues are speaking to you, but I need you to turn around and start speaking to them. I know your health issues are speaking to you, but I need you to turn around and start speaking to them. And say to them, watch this, old dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 5, thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely, somebody say surely. In other words, you can take this to the bank. This check will cash every day. Surely I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall what? Live. Verse 6, I will put sinews or flesh on you, or, 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 or tissue on you, rather, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall what? Live. Then you shall know that you know <laughs> that your no-nos, that your no-nos and your no-nos something that I am the Lord. Look, look at your neighbor and say, what you've been dealing with is to get rid of your unbelief. G God says, I put you in a precarious predicament so that you would know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I am the Lord and beside me there is no other. That's why if he doesn't make a way, a way can't be made. T to neighbor say, it's killing your unbelief. Verse 7, so I prophesied or spoke as I, I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. Somebody say noise, rattling, drama, issues, problems. But watch this. But as the noise was happening, that's when the bones were coming together. Bone to bone. Skip down to verse 10. So I prophesied or spoke as he commanded me, and breath came into me, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Father, I decrease that you might increase now. Speak to us over these next few moments as we go another further, as we explore this topic of surge. That's what we are in, and that's why I speak into the lives of everybody under the sound of my voice, a sudden and powerful forward or upward advancement. Father, we thank you that average has got to let us go. Mediocre has got to let us go. Go. Just getting by has got to let us go because we are in a surge in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
As you take your seats, high five, two or three people. Tell them today's message topic. Tell them, say, your surge is in your strategic prayer. It's a long one. It's a long one. Your surge is in your strategic prayer. You can be seated. As you know, our theme this year is surge, which is a sudden, powerful, forward or upward movement. And in this series, we're receiving simple. Somebody say simple. Biblical principles that can create surges in our every area of our lives. Now, the first principle I gave you last week was that your surge is in your what? Stretch. And the second principle that I want to give you today is that your surge is in your strategic prayer. So these messages are, are going to be very different in the way I normally teach. I'm a revelator, so I like to give revelation, which means I like to uncover that which is hidden in the text. But in these messages, I just want to give you, there's one overarching principle throughout the whole message, and we're getting ready to unpack it. Uh, like you packed up a U-Haul and you fit as much stuff on that 1999 as you possibly could, and you really needed to get the 3999 one. So what I'm doing is in one principle, I'm packing as much in here and throughout this entire message we're going to unpack it look at the neighbor and say let's unpack it now, now, so far in this series, I introduce you to a surger named Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 37, the Lord placed him, a man of God, in a valley of dry bones and told him to prophesy or speak to the bones. Say, speak to the bones. Uh, now, the question I have for you is, why would God tell Ezekiel to speak to bones? They are inanimate objects. Bones, I don't know about you, uh, but every time I've gone to a museum and looked at the skeleton that was there, that skeleton didn't start talking back to me. God said, I want you to speak to an inanimate object. Why in the world would God say, speak to an inanimate object? After all, shouldn't God just say, Ezekiel, talk to me and let me and you figure this out? Why would God have Ezekiel to turn his conversation, not to a conversation with God, but to a conversation with an inanimate object? Look at your neighbor and say, why would God do that? All right, I'm glad you asked that. You're a very smart and spiritual person. Because everything we speak is a prayer. Look at your neighbor and say, everything you speak is a prayer. So, so we got to be strategic in how we speak, meaning if it's not surging, don't say it. I, I'm trying to tell some of you the reason that you've been, and I'm going to unpack this because some of you are like, what do you mean everything we speak is a prayer? I'm going to show you. But please understand, that's the reason why when you get angry or when you get frustrated or when you get mad, what's the first thing you want to do? Say something crazy. Why? Because the enemy knows the only way he can get you to trip up is for you to trip yourself up. All right, let's unpack it. Touch your neighbor and say, let's unpack it. Now, I've taught you uh, this before, but I want you to see it again in the context of Ezekiel 37. In James 5, 17, James 5, 17, if you don't have a Bible, they'll put it on the screen. James 5 and 17, it says, Elijah. Now, this is not Ezekiel. This is another man of God named Elijah, but I want you to see the principle. Touch your neighbor says, it's about to get real good. Now, now, Denver, if you don't shout off of this, I don't know what's going to make you shout. Maybe in the overflow they'll shout because, well, watch this, James 5, 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now, what does that mean? He was a speaking spirit that's in the body. You are a spirit that possesses a soul, which is your mind, thoughts, will, and emotions, but you live in a physical body. Does your neighbor say, I'm just like Elijah. Now, look what it says. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Does your neighbor say he prayed earnestly? Now, please understand, if this man who's a speaking spirit that has a soul that lives in a body, if I'm just like him, whatever he did, then that tells me I have the ability to do myself. So I don't know about you, but I want to know exactly what it was that he prayed, because if I find out what he prayed, if I'm just like him, I can get the similar results as he did. Anybody else agree with that? All right, watch this. So let's see what he did. First Kings 17 and 1. First Kings 17 and 1. I want, I've taught you this before, but I want you to see it in the context of why God would tell Ezekiel to speak to dry bones. First Kings 17 1. Now, what did James say? He prayed what? Earnestly. He did what? Prayed. How? Earnestly. Just your neighbor said, that was some good prayer. If you grew up in the church, I don't know about you, but did you ever look at certain people who prayed a certain way and thought, God, dog, they can pray because they pray real long or they pray real deep words. And you'd be like, I don't know what that is, but it sounds deep and spiritual. Don't look at me with that tone of face. You know what I'm talking about? And you'd be like, God, if I could ever just pray like so-and-so, they talking about uh, the going up to the third heaven and this and that. And I'm like, God, dog, I didn't even know it was three. There he is, by the way. Third heaven is where God dwells. Come to Bible college. You find out all about it. That's your neighbor say, this was some good praying. In fact, I, I, in the South, we said like that, that was some show prayer. If you were deep South, we might say it like this, that was cold-blooded. Cold-blooded doesn't actually mean cold-blooded. Cold-blooded actually is a Southern colloquialism, which means that was great. 
So the day when you go eat after church and the meal is good, just look at somebody at the table and say, this is cold-blooded. Tell somebody, that was some shown up prayer. So let's see what he did. 1 Kings 17 and 1. And Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Well, now, wait a minute. He didn't say nothing to God. But the Bible calls what he spoke prayer. You don't understand what I'm saying. Every time you open your mouth because you are a speaking spirit, the Bible calls that prayer. And you think just because you didn't say in Jesus' name, amen, it wasn't prayer. God says when you open your mouth, it's prayer. And that's why you got to be careful when you get angry because when you get angry, you pray something that... Touch your neighbor say, watch what you're saying. Tell them if it's not surging, don't say it. Now, I want you to understand that if, if, you, if you have a traditional Bible, you'll see a cross-reference in James chapter 5, and you'll see the cross-reference leads right to 1 Kings chapter 17. The purpose of the cross-reference is because when it says he prayed earnestly, somebody say he prayed earnestly. The only thing he actually did, watch this, was say to Ahab, who was the king, as the, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And the Bible calls that earnest prayer. So when you said yesterday, nothing ever works for me, the Bible called that earnest prayer. And when you said your children are crazy, the Bible calls that earnest prayer. And when you said your credit will never get better, the Bible calls that earnest prayer. So no wonder you keep getting what you've been saying because what you're saying is really prayer. I'm going to push this another further because I don't think we got it. Now, go to verse 7, 1 Kings 17 and 7. And it happened after a while that the book dried up. Why? Because exactly what he said is what he saw. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Y'all pulling that Denver stuff on me. Okay, that's cool. Let's back it up. 17 and 1. I want you to read it so, so you can get it in your shonda. One, two, ready, read. Stop. He spoke, watch this, to the king. Now, the king had a wife whose name was Jezebel, who tried to intimidate men of God. And so she tried to punk Elijah, but Elijah was like, uh-uh. Uh, you must not know about me. Now, you punk them other prophets, but I'm not the one. You can scare them other preachers. I'm not the one. You can scare them other bishops. I ain't the one. That's what he said. So it's like, I ain't even talking to Jesse. She crazy. I want to talk to you. Because the reason she crazy is because you let her be. Because everything rises and falls on leadership. So if it's a problem with the children, check the daddy. If it's a problem with the wife, check the husband. Watch. He says, as the Lord God of Israel lives. Now, just so we're clear, he lives what? Forever. Before time was, I am. After time ceases to exist, I am. As we are in time today, I am. He is the great I am. As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, it's not raining. It ain't even going to be a mist. Except when I say so. Now, Elijah was a man just like us. So, so Bishop, why did God honor what he said? Because what he said was prayer. Are you still here? Verse 7. And it happened. You read it. Once you ready to read. Stop. You know what you get tripped up about is because you said it today, and when it don't happen by Tuesday, you're like, Lord, it ain't working. No, it's working. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up. Now, this was the brook that Elijah was next to because there had been no what? 
reign in the land. He saw what he said, but it took six verses to manifest. I'm going to tell somebody, keep speaking strategic until you see it. Tell somebody, say, keep speaking strategic until you see it. Here it is. So when Ezekiel strategically spoke to the bones, he was really praying strategically. And strategic prayer doesn't just make requests, it prays the answer. When Ezekiel, watch this, was in the valley of dry bones, he did not say, ooh wee, these bones are so dry. He did not say, ooh wee, I'm so stressed. Ooh wee, I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired. No, that's not strategic prayer. You keep getting what you're saying because what you're saying is a mess. But today, something shifts in the way you speak about your own life. Something's getting ready to shift in the way you speak about your own children. Something's getting ready to shift in the way you speak about your own family. Touch your neighbor and say, be strategic. Watch this. He didn't pray the problem. Instead, he called all of the components together. Notice what God told him. He said, listen, tell the sinew, that's tissue, to come together. And he says, listen, speak to the breath, that's oxygen. And then he says, speak to skin so that it covers them. Say strategic. Now, watch this. The formula for strategic prayer is found in James chapter 5, one verse before what I just showed you in verse 16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, let's just break this down. T touch your neighbor and say, stay with Bishop. Now, righteous man, that Romans 4 teaches us that that's us. God has given us his righteousness as a free gift. Bishop, what does all that mean? Right to be righteous means to be in right standing with God. If you're in right standing with Sprint, your phone works. Come on, come on, come on, you understand? If you're in right standing with Cricket, we don't get the answering machine. That's not your voice. Don't look at me like y'all don't know about the answer we seen. It's not your voice. If you're in right standing with your automobile uh, lender, you still have your car. If you're in right standing with your mortgage holder, you still live in your house. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So to be in right standing with God means that when he looks at me, it's like I have an 850 FICO. Now... FICO stands for, that's your fair eyes, a credit observation. Now, 850 means your credit is perfect. It is the creme de la creme of credit. So watch this. T touch your name and say, he gave us that. God, we hung on that tree, said, they are never going to be able to live in a way to where their credit is ever better than like a 515. So what I'll do is come die in their place and I'll take their bad credit and I'll give them my good credit. So when the Bible says righteous, it just means that my credit is good. Now, listen, why, do I, why am I giving this analogy in the terms of credit? Because when you go apply for something, uh, let, me see, let me see another word for apply. When I go ask for something, if my credit's good, the deal is already approved. So the reason you need to know that your credit's good with God is that when you ask for it, stop saying, well, I didn't do this right, I didn't do this right, I didn't do this right. He gave you his good credit in exchange for your bad credit. Did you catch that? All right, all right, touch your neighbor and say, your credit is good with God. Which means you don't have to go and... <laughs> Let me leave that alone. Now, now watch this, watch this, watch this. So, so Romans 4 teaches us that we are righteous. Say, I am righteous. Now, check this out. Here's what happens if you grew up in a religious environment. The religious environment teaches you this, that you act righteous to become righteous. So don't do this, 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 and you'll be righteous. But, but the issue is, is, is that when you're working to become, you operate differently than when you are operating because you are. I'm already righteous, therefore I can live righteously. It is not I'm trying to live righteous to become righteous. My credit's already good, which is why I don't act like folk with bad credit. Are you catching the analogy here? Which means when I understand that I am, it automatically changes what I do. And I'm not changing what I do to become what I already am. It's because I am. I change what... Tell your neighbor, say, you're already righteous. So let, let people talk about you. You just do nothing to go to church. You don't do that. Yes, because he's made me righteous. And so I can live righteously. 
You can have your bad credit all you want. Just your neighbor say, but it's for me and my house. Our credit is good. Now, credit is the way they say it in the deep south. You know, credit is credit. Now, I need you to see that because you may be like, Bishop, I don't even pray because I just know I ain't right. Well, then just die then. I'm just saying, because, because if you, if, if, as long as you are doing to become, you're always going to feel less than. But if you understand, I already am, so I do. Did you catch that? All right, watch this now. Watch this. The effective. Effective means successful in producing the intended result. Say effective. In other words, we could use there would be the, in the title of the message. It would be strategic. Now, most Christians pray very generic. Let me prove it to you. Lord, just bless. He's already done that. So that's, a, you just, okay. All right, well, you just wasted your time there. Watch this. Some of y'all know this one. Lord, touch. Come on, look at me. Come on, come on. Be How many of you prayed that prayer? Like, Lord, just touch. Well, what do you want him to touch? When do you want him to touch it? How do you want him to touch it? What is the purpose of him touching him? Last time he touched somebody, he broke the hip. Are you sure you want him to touch? He reached out to Jacob, and he was like, I bet you ain't going to walk the same no more. It's quiet. Lord, just do whatever you need to do. So you know what he did? He took everything. Because he said, you'll only listen to me. You, you pray generic prayers so you get generic results. So the scripture says the effective or the strategic prayers of the righteous. Now, watch this. Now, watch this. Say effective. But watch this. It, it, listen, listen to it. It's conditional because effective comma implies effective and. So the effective and fervent. Fervent here means passionate. Say passionate. It literally means to burn with urgency. When you tell God, Lord, just one day, he stops listening. You might stop listening because there's no urgency. Fervent prayers say, I got to have it, and I got to have it now. Which means, watch this, I don't speak as if it is coming. I speak as if it is. Why? Because he calls things that be not as though they were. And I need you to catch this. I need you to catch this. Say effective and fervent. All right, so. Uh, watch this. It's got to be strategic and passionate. So when you, Father, just, you know, it would be really great. Lord, if you just did something really magnificent today. Oh, how I love you. God is like, there's no fervency in your prayer. And who wants to be wanted by somebody who only wants it because they have to want them? God says, I want your prayer to be strategic and passionate. Now, if you grew up in like a Pentecostal circles, you know, you, you, you had the fervent part. Or, you know, old school Baptist circles, you had the fervent part. Lord, we want you to do it today. Huh? Move by your spirit. Huh? And Lord, Lord, Jesus. Huh? Ah, won't you do it, Jesus? Huh? A touch, Lord. Huh? Move, Lord. Huh? Won't you do it today? Huh? Anybody need him to do it? Then you turn from prayer to preaching. And all you've done is mess up your throat because God says you ain't said nothing. You ain't said, you ain't done nothing but sweat your suit out. You ain't said nothing. Heaven ain't getting ready to do nothing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right, so watch this. I need you to get this. So if, say effective and fervent. So that means it's got to be strategic and passionate. What if you started praying and speaking like your life depended on it? You, you know a problem? Let me tell you, let me tell you, you spiritual, let me tell you your name is problem. It is that they're too passive. You're spiritual. I'm not talking about you, your neighbor. You spiritual, you got it. You you got this together. You're a man like Elijah. You're a woman like Elijah. Okay. But your neighbor though, they're so passive. Lord, whatever you want to do today. Well, then why did he tell you to command the work of his hands? 
Why didn't God just put the bones together? Why did he make Ezekiel speak to him? Because God says, I want you to be passionate about your own life. I want you to be passionate about your own future. Stop expecting other people to be excited about you when you ain't excited about yourself. Touch your neighbor and say, get your passion for life. All this passivity. God says, I'm not about that life. Now, watch this. Effective, say strategic, and passionate. All right, and we're going to do it in just a moment. Uh, it avails what? Much. Layman's terminology, it gets stuff done. Say, it gets stuff done. Now, how many of you, you want your prayer to get some stuff done? All right, because some of you, you, you have been illegitimately indicting God. You've been bringing charges against God for the quality of your life when it's really a lack of effective and fervent prayers on your behalf. Lord, my life, Lord, why aren't you doing anything? He says, you ain't asked me to do nothing. Touch. <laughs> Move. <sighs> Lord, I want to catch you in church. He's not a cold. You don't catch the Holy Ghost. You know. Are you here? All right, watch this. Now, watch this. We're going into third gear. Here it is. When Ezekiel strategically prayed, somebody said there was a rattling. Now, when he finally got strategic and fervent, when he got passionate and specific, when he said, I need these bones to live, and I need them to live now, when both of those things came together, there was a rattling. Somebody, somebody said there was a rattling. And I need you to hear me. When you start praying strategically, there might be a rattling to discourage you. But notice that the rattling was from the bones getting in order, which means the rattling is your confirmation that your strategic prayer has already started your surge. Look at your neighbor and say, don't you be scared of that rattle. Baby, it's just a rattle. Don't you be scared of the rattle. Don't you let the noise scare you. Don't you let the drama scare you. Don't you let the bill in the mail scare you. Don't you let the doctor's report scare you. It's just a rattle. And the rattle is my evidence that my strategic prayer is already working. Tell somebody say it's already working. It's too late. The surge has already started. Satan already lost. Your enemies have already lost. What's this? Watch this. Now, now watch this. We, we, watch this. T touch your neighbor and say, stay with Bishop. Now, I'm out of time right here, but I need to finish this. I, I, I slowed it down for us. Now, we use the dry bones as a metaphor for problems, but we learned that there were three other Hebrew definitions for the word bones in, in, uh, in the first week of this series. Do you remember the first word? Cell, which means the valley of dry bones literally means a valley of self. It was like a valley of mirrors. It is a valley that God places you in where he makes you look at you and deal with you. But then it was a valley of the second word, pains, which means inflicted by others. Uh, uh, please understand, you can have pain inflicted by others. You can have pains that are inflicted by yourself. And you can have pains that are inflicted from stretching. Whenever you're growing, there will be pain. But the pain is good because it's really an indication of gain. You're crying about what you should shout about because it made you stronger. And then it's the valley of, in Hebrew, the same, which means the same old song about life. But there's another meaning of bones I didn't tell you. Okay, God bless y'all. Thank you for coming today. Be encouraged. I said there's a fourth definition of this word, dry bones, I didn't give you. It's wood. W-O-O-D. Okay. It's a valley of wood. All right, that's all right. Come on, everybody. Let's get on the big bus together. Bishop, what are you saying? I only need wood when I'm getting ready to build something. Meaning, whatever you're in, whatever bones, whatever problems, whatever pain, whatever mirrors, whatever the same, these are all building blocks that you need to build. All right, let me, let me, let me walk us through it. Let me walk us through it. T -t -t let me say walk with Bishop. M meaning this, y'all, that the bones, the problems, the mirrors, the pains, the same. They were all the wood or building blocks that Ezekiel needed to build an army. But he had to strategically pray so that he could surge. You missed it. Your problems are your wood. Chester neighbors, I'm building something. 
Look at the other one and say, I'm working on something right now. And you can't tell what it's going to be right now because I'm just in the ground stages of it. But I'm here to tell you that valley didn't go to waste. Those problems didn't go to waste. Those tears didn't go to waste. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm building something. I'm working on something. Listen to me. You keep praying for God to add this and God's response to you is you got everything you need already. Simply waiting on your strategic prayer. And that's why 2 Peter 1.3 says that he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. But we must be strategic opposed to generic. Here's how most people pray when they're in problems. Lord, get me out. If he gets you out, you have no wood. If he brings you out of that, you may be shouting that you're out of it. The problem is you ain't got nothing because you couldn't build nothing because the wood was in the valley. When most people start going through stuff, they skip church and God says, you fool, you missing your wood. When somebody hurts somebody, most people, God says, you fool, that's your wood. Say, Lord, forgive me for complaining about my wood. I know they hurt you, but you're building something now. It's called wisdom, meaning you may have got me once, but I won't make that mistake again. I'm building something. You may have lost the business, but you got some lessons and you got some wisdom. I'm building something. I'm working on something. Touch somebody say, I'm building something. But now watch this. Imagine, imagine, imagine if Ezekiel, imagine if Ezekiel said, Lord, just, just pull it all together, Jesus. Or just move. It was God that put him there. God won't rebuke himself. I said, God won't rebuke himself. So when you pray to get out of this valley of dry bones, God says the issue is, is if I get you out, you will remain at the level of life you were before you went in. Because you couldn't build anything. Because the wood you need to build is in that valley. Test your neighbor and say, celebrate your valley. So Ezekiel was strategic. All right, say strategic. Now, I'm just talking us through this because I, I need us to get this. Are you still with me? Say strategic and passionate, effective and fervent. Now, watch this. Here's the last part of the unpacking. I want to do this strategic prayer in part one. We'll do some more in part two. Strategic prayer asks to comply so he'll automatically supply. I'm going to say it again. Strategic prayer has to comply so he'll automatically supply. This perhaps um, is, is, is such a powerful revelation. It's so simple, but it's so powerful. Say powerful. If you get this today, I'm here to tell you some of y'all's surge will be done by Monday afternoon. It, the only reason it takes as long as it's been taken is because you've not been strategic and fervent. But today, I said, but today. But today. Now watch this, watch this. Often what we pray for doesn't manifest because the criteria hasn't been met. So because you didn't comply, there's no supply. When you're out of order, you won't get your order. For every scripture on your targeted prayer list, pray to be in compliance with the criteria instead of to receive the result. Bishop, how do I make a targeted prayer list? You need to take care of you to learn how to make one. Now watch this. I want to use two scriptures for an example. And this is going to rock your world. You ready for this? This is so simple. Now, I'll preach it in the next one. I'm just walking us through it in the 9 to 10. Watch this. Isaiah 1 and 19. If you've been a Christian for, you know, I don't know, a day or so, you probably have heard this one. Go ahead and put it on the screens. You know this one, right? Say it with me. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Now, that's a good promise, right? I mean, that sounds exciting, right? Now, land here in Hebrew just means life. So if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat, uh, eat of a good life. And uh, 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 the one translation says it like this. If you're willing and obedient, I will make you rich. 
The rich doesn't just mean money because you can have money and not have uh, health, which means really all you have is money. You're not rich. Now, watch this. Here's what most people pray. Lord, give me the good of the land. But if you're not willing and obedient, you're out of compliance. You didn't hear me. So instead of asking for the good of the land, Lord, just give me a good life. Instead of asking God for a good life, check this out, pray to be willing and obedient. Because if you're willing and obedient, you'll automatically eat the good of the land. All right. All right, we catch again. Most of us ask for the promise. Put it up. Most of us ask for the promise when instead we should ask to be in compliance with the criteria. So you're asking for promise, and God is like, well, it's here. But you're out of compliance. And because you're out of compliance, I can't release that to you. Not because I don't love you, but you're just out of compliance. So if you pray to comply, supply will be automatic. Let me give you another scripture. Let me give you another scripture. Let me give you another scripture. Another example, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, you know it who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Leave the scripture there for a moment. Now, what do most of us pray? Lord, please forgive me. Land here in Hebrew means ways, which means life. So, so he says, and heal my life. So, so watch this, watch this, watch this. Most of us pray, Lord, please forgive me. Lord, just heal my life. Lord, I'm hurt. My, my heart is broken. And I asked him not to break my heart, my achy, breaky heart. Then I boot, scoot, and boogie, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> now watch. Most people say, Lord, I just need to hear from heaven. Lord, give me a word. Give me, give me a word, Lord. Oh, glory, give me a word. That's the promise. But if I pray to comply, the supply is automatic. Are y'all getting this? It's simple, ain't it? But it's powerful, right? Because what I'm here to tell you is essentially the way you've been praying up until now may have been fervent, but wasn't effective. In most instances, if my people say that's us, who are called by my name, say that's us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Face there in Hebrew means attitude. God says, seek to have an attitude like me. That's what he said. Now, now watch this. Instead of praying for everything after then, what effective and fervent prayer does is praise for everything after the if before the then. So leave it there for a moment. Watch this. Look at the name. Say, pray to be humble. Say, pray for his attitude. And say, turn from your wicked ways. If I pray to comply with that, he's automatically going to supply forgiveness and he's automatically going to heal my life. When I pray to comply, the supply is automatic. Did you catch that? Now I'm done. I know. I know. You're like, Bishop, you ain't got no more? No. Not for part one. For part two, we're going to take it another further. So here's what I want to do. The reason the teaching is somewhat shorter is because I, I want you now to put in practice what you just learned. And we're going to do it right here before we leave church today. Whether you're in the auditorium or in the overflow or on Roku or wherever you're at, we're getting ready to put James chapter 5 in work. We're going to be effective and fervent. Y'all ready to do it? Are y'all ready to do it? Now, if, you're if you want to have the same thing you've been having in life, please keep your seats. For those of you who say, I'm ready for surge to manifest, would you please stand? If you think you got it together, you just be seated because I don't want you messing up your neighbor's prayers. So we're just not interested in all that. Hallelujah. Now, now, here's what the first thing we need to do. Say effective, fervent. All right. So I'm going to pray, and you're just going to repeat after me, and then I'm going to let you loose so you can get some stuff set in order for your life. 
And watch this. Some of you, but Bishop, you know, I, I just, I, listen, if it starts rattling, that ain't nobody but Elmo. And that's what happened for some of you is you've been coming to church and you've been getting stuff in order and then you had rattling. You're like, oh, my God, why is it rattling? Why is it? That ain't nobody but Elmo. And he just wants you to tickle. That's all this is thing. Okay? I'm just being facetious. All right? Because anybody said, don't be scared of the rattle. That's all it is. A rattlesnake makes that noise because the truth is they really don't want to bite. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right, so here's what we're going to do. Lift your hands. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the revelation I've received today. This revelation changes how I pray. In the name of Jesus, I ask for forgiveness for every sin. Every wicked way committed knowingly and unknowingly. I cancel the power of everything I spoke that was not strategic and was not surging. Not only do I cancel the power of it, I cancel the harvest of every negative thing, of everything that was not surging that I spoke concerning my life and in this moment and from this moment forward everything I speak everything I declare will be effective and fervent strategic and passionate in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus now here's what I want you to do 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 now now, now look at your neighbor say you get ready to go for yourself that was the wrong neighbor. Talk to the other one. Tell them, so you get ready to go for yourself. All right, now here's, here's all I want you to do. I want to just use one thing today. Whatever the greatest thing God could manifest in your life right now, whatever it is, and let me just go on and say this. Don't let it be for God to bring somebody back. Don't waste your prayer trying to convince somebody that don't want to be convinced of something. I want this prayer to be for you concerning you. And you pray for that next week. You pray for that tomorrow. You pray for all that later. This prayer right here, say this one right here. This one right here, I want you to be for you. you know, we pray about people and all that. We pray about that later. This one right here. Say this one right here. This one's going to be for you. Now, whatever the greatest thing God can manifest in your life, let's be effective. Let's be fervent. Got it? If it's a job... Bishop, what's an effective and fervent prayer that I need if, I, if I'm unemployed and, and I need a job? Well, please understand, if you're a giver, he said, if I trusted him with my tithe and offering, that he would open up the windows of heaven and pour me out such blessing. So here's the compliance. Father, since I'm a giver, I put a demand on the supply. If you're not a giver, what's your prayer? Lord, Make me a giver so then I can put a demand on supply. Y'all see it? See why I talked us through it today? Now, I'm going to preach it at 11.15. I just talked it at the 9.15. All right? If, if your prayer is for health or healing in your body, all right, healing is the children's bread. It, it's already paid for. It. Well, if the Lord wants me to be healed, that's the most stupid thing you could ever say. But why is it stupid? Because he paid for it already. That's like going to the store. I don't know about you, but if I paid for anything, like when they, t you know, some I like extra sauces when I go to restaurants. I like sauce. I like ranch. I like honey mustard. I like barbecue. I like whatever else the other one you brought out is. I don't even know what it is. I just said, what is it? I want that too. And what's on her plate? I want that. What's on his plate? I want that too. Give me all them sauces. Now, here's the deal. One time I went to a restaurant. I was with a pastor, and they charged me for all them sauces. I said, I didn't know you charged me for them sauces. I said, in that case, fill it all the way up then. I just didn't know you was going to charge me for it, so I'm going to need it all for it. Anything I pay for, I won't. So he's already paid for healing. So since he's already paid for it, you don't say, Lord, if you want to heal me, heal. Well, then that prayer is not strategic, nor is it fervent, because you don't even believe it when you said it. Instead, your declaration is, because I'm yours, healing is mine. Does this make sense, everybody? So whatever your prayer is for you, I just gave you two examples. And we're going to it another further. I encourage you to be here on Wednesday. Uh, again, if you can be here, be here. And if you can't be here, be here. All right? 
He's going to say, you got too much growing and too much surge needs to happen in your life for you to be missing church to watch Empire. If you keep on, I'm going to invite Cookie to be the new pastor, and y'all, it's going to be a whole nother church. It's going to be a whole nother church. You're going to run it a whole nother kind of way. <laughs> it's going <gonna be> a <laughs> to be a whole nother kind of pastor, you understand? Come late to her church. <laughs> you know, look at me like y'all don't know who I'm talking about. You're going to be like, oh, my God, I don't even know. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right, so I want you to take 30 seconds, whatever the one thing for you, for you, say for me. A better you makes better of those around you. Better the husband, better the wife. Better the parent, better the children. Better the pastor, better the church. Better the CEO, better the company. Got it? All right, so, so, so I, in this moment, I just want you to deal with you. Don't pray for anybody else right now. And I know that sounds contrary to Christian doctrine, but right now, say just for this moment, I'm going for myself. Now, whatever that is, take 30 seconds and be effective and be passionate. Be specific. Does Lord just touch? Okay, do you not listen to the last 37 minutes I've been talking? Okay, be specific. Lord, bless. What do you want him to bless? How do you want him to bless it? What do you want to see come out of that situation? Make sense, everybody? Y'all ready, 915? Are y'all ready, 915? Are there some Elijahs in the house? Are there some Ezekiels in the house? All right. 30 seconds. Go for what you know. 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 You're going for yourself. Hallelujah. Father, hear the request of your people. In the name of Jesus, strategic prayer creates surges. Strategic prayer creates surges. Strategic prayer creates surges. Strategic prayer creates surges. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. If you're watching online, I need you to do the same thing. Do the same thing right now. If you're watching online, if you're at a Roku site, do the same thing right now. If you're in the overflow here at the Royal Campus, do the same thing right now. Be fervent about it, y'all. Where's your fervency? Where's your passion? Where's your passion? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab the hand of somebody next to you. Now you're going to pray for them. I want you to pray for them on both your left and your right. Pray specific and strategic for them. Specific and strategic for them. God create surges in their life in the name of Jesus. God create fervency in their life in the name of Jesus. We rebuke every distraction that would attempt to set itself against them. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke discouragement off of them. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke discouragement. We rebuke depression off of them. In the name of Jesus, we declare that passion would come alive in their lives, about their lives. We declare their greatest days are still ahead of them. Restore their vision. Restore their sight. Restore the joy of their salvation. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, pray for them, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now begin to pray for their family that their family would come into the divine order of God, that all of their family would become Christians and give their lives to Jesus. I don't care if they're Buddhist. I don't care if they're Hindu. I don't care if they're Muslims. This is the year of the surge, and everybody's got to be saved in their family. Everybody's got to be saved in their family. Yeah. Yeah. 
and we speak to their cousins that are abusing drugs and we pray that the Holy Ghost will take the addiction out of their mouth, out of their system. In the name of Jesus, we speak to their family members that are abusing alcohol and we ask that the Holy Ghost would go and take that taste out of their mouth in the name of Jesus and that the Holy Ghost would begin to draw them unto himself. Draw them unto himself. Draw them unto himself. Strategic and fervent, specific and passionate. Pray like you believe it's happening. Pray like you believe it's happening. Pray like you believe it's happening. Now we're going to pray over their finances. Father, in the name of Jesus, you have not created us to lack Therefore, we reject and we rebuke a poverty mindset. We reject and we rebuke a mindset of lack. We reject and we rebuke a slave mentality. We reject and we rebuke living paycheck to paycheck. And in the name of Jesus, your word declares that above all things, that we would prosper, that we would be shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking, all is well. That's what we speak and squeeze that hand. That's what we speak into their lives in the name of Jesus. And we speak to their debt and command it to be gone in the name of Jesus. Cause creditors now to lose the paperwork in the name of Jesus. Your word declares in Deuteronomy 15 that at the end of every seven year cycle there would be a release of debt. And therefore in the name of Jesus since we've just ended a seven year cycle we declare there's a debt release coming on them in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Student loan debts are getting ready to be wiped away. I said student loan. I speak to every student loan debt and command it to be wiped away. I need some fervent and some... We declare that that addictive shopper mentality that buys to compensate for a lack of that it'd be broken in the name of Jesus. That if it ain't wisdom, it ain't wisdom. And that they would have the restraint. Lay your hands on yourself. See how this works? See, I'm not just saying, Lord, do something. I'm very specific about it. Are you seeing how this works, Harvest? I'm teaching you how to do this. Say, I'm learning. Say it like you mean it. Say, I'm learning. Lay your hands on yourself. Now say your name. Say in the name of Jesus, every hurt, every pain, emotionally, spiritually, I declare that because I'm in compliance, supply is automatic. I seek your attitude. Come on, say it. I seek your attitude, God. I declare that I'm humble. That means I'm teachable. I don't think I know it all. My fruit proves that I don't. I turn from my wicked ways. Convict me, Holy Ghost, if I'm pursuing a wicked way. Remind me who I am when I start thinking less than I am when I begin to think like a fool speak to the king in me remind him remind her of who they are the head and not the tail above and not beneath always overcoming never being overcome my passion for my life is ignited right now I will no longer be passive about my life it matters that I was born I will no longer be passive about handling God's business it's the only thing that matters I'm passionate about my life I'm passionate about why I was born for this reason was I sent to rule to conquer to reign and to subdue every circumstance. In Jesus' name. 
Lay your hands on yourself. Tell yourself you are a king and a priest. According to Revelation 1.6. According to Revelation 1.6. That means I am successful and spiritual. Because I comply, you automatically supply. In Jesus' name. Now let your fervency, let your passion emanate from this place. That's all you got? That's all you got? You just learn how to turn everything around. That's all you got? Where are the radical people at? Where are the passionate people at? Where are you at? Where? You're not going back the same. You're going back to the same house, but you're different. You may go back to the same situation, but you're different. You may go back to the same family, but you're different. I declare there's something different. Everywhere in this place, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I got good news for you. The first effective and fervent thing you got to do is give your life to God. 2,000 years ago, he... God stepped in a body. The body was named Jesus. That body got on the cross. That body paid the price for our sins. Sins are things that we do that don't please God. They don't please God because they hurt us. He died so we could have life and life more abundantly. Say life and life more abundantly. And today, if you need to become a Christian for the first time or recommit yourself to Jesus, maybe you've fallen away. Maybe you started going off and doing your own thing. Today, when I was praying with some pastors this morning, one of the prayers they prayed, they said, Bishop, they prayed that that, that wayward sons and daughters, that they would, they would come to themselves and they would come up out of their pig pens. And so today, maybe you've fallen away from God. Maybe you started doing your own thing. And maybe you thought it was more difficult to come back to God because you didn't know where to start to get things right with God. So you kept running from God because it seemed too difficult to know where to start with God. You know where you start with God? It's real simple. You were right. Me no es writer. I said that in Spanish. Where my Spanish? And then y'all, oh. Where my Spanish? <laughs> Touch your name and say, one step. So today, if you need to become a Christian or recommit yourself to Jesus, on the count of three, wherever you're at, I want you to throw your hand up. And when you do, you're going to have a bunch of us shouting and celebrating for you because we were all once standing in that same place. And what I love about our church harvest is we're not going to beat you up. We're not going to beat you down. We're not going to kick you while you're down. We're going to love you and love you to life. You are 100% unconditionally loved, not just by God, but every time you step through that door, you are 100% unconditionally loved. Did you hear what I just said to you? Did you hear what I just said to you? You ain't got to pretend. You ain't got to fake. You ain't got to act. You don't have to pontificate. You, when you step through those doors, you step into the unconditional love zone. And since he's patient with you while you're changing, we'll be patient with you while you're changing. Hallelujah. If you need to become a Christian for the first time or recommit yourself to Jesus, on the count of three, throw your hands up. One, two, three. If that's you, throw that hand up. I see you. I see you. Come on, Harvest. You can do better than that. Let's celebrate the hands we can't see at Overflow or online. Hallelujah. Now, I want every hand lifted. Everybody to say this with me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. For dying in my place because of that belief, because of that confession. If this is my first time praying this, I am a Christian. If I was far from you, I'm reconnected to you. Great days are ahead of me. 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 Ahead of me. I am in a surge in the name of Jesus. Would you give God praise all over this place? Listen, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or you just recommitted yourself to Jesus, if you will take out your mobile phone and text the word decision to the phone number 59769, it's there on the screen. We're going to send you a text message right away to help you serve Jesus faithfully. Listen, many people raise their hands. Sometimes people don't send a text. You need to send the text because it seals the deal because it gives you some free materials you need to serve Jesus faithfully. Amen? Amen. Listen, you can grab your seat for just a moment real quickly. Are you glad you came to church today? I said, are you glad you came to church today?